So let's get down to brass tacks. So we've said already there are three ways, which is number one, get a job. Number two, get a gig. Number three, start a business. Oh, I like that. Maybe when you're editing this, just like insert that bit at the beginning before we went off on the massive tangent about people with disposable income and saving. Hello and welcome to Clickety Click episode 66 of oh, Don't Look At Me Like That of a South Life podcast, the honest guide to living and working abroad. I'm Leanne. And I'm Al. And welcome back. Hello. So today we have part two of three for you in our little series we're calling How to Move Abroad in 2022. Just a little bit of um, background then. So the episode, if you've listened to it, then good for you. Well done. If you haven't, then go back to listen to episode 65. And this is the first of three questions we ask. The questions are, why do you want to live, live and work abroad? Then two, how do you work, live and work abroad? And then three, where do you live and work abroad? And we st- and most people start off with the where, don't they? Most people. And it's, it seems like a, a logical place to start. Except that... We've been traveling now since 2013. Uh, We left the UK and we think, or what our opinion is, that you start off with the why. Because that's a much more important and actually a bit more of a fun question, but also maybe not so fun sometimes. Because we talk about it sometimes people move around the world and and, uh, all this changes the view out the window. And if you're not careful, if you think moving abroad is going to be a fresh start, it's going to be the answer to all of your problems, then we're here to tell you, I'm afraid we don't think that is true. It might be the answer to a few of your problems. It might be the answer to a lot of them. Um, But I think as well, when we've reflected back on our experience and how we came to leave the UK and live and work abroad, this is pretty much the process we went through Mm -hmm. today we're assuming that you've got through that assuming that you're happy with that (laughs) assuming that you took the red pill (laughs) (laughs) you'll know then you'll need now we're going to talk about the how and basically this is probably about 80 percent about money isn't it or income yeah yeah let's be honest money makes the world go around it we need money to live whether you agree or disagree with that it is a fact so we need to talk about how you how you do that and the various options that you have to to make money and live abroad uh, my thinking is that there are three ways in which you can make money when you live and work abroad go uh, number one is a job sure a job is a good way <laughs> to make money agreed two number two is a freelancer a different kind of job too yeah agreed yep. And three is to own your own business and earn money that way. Another kind of job. Yes. yes. Agreed. <laughs> so it's is, the overarching aim to have a job or automated income should you be so fortunate to be in that position. I think so. I mean, the fourth one is, as you say, is to is to have made smart investments, invested in Uber when they were just before they floated. Or done a Forrest Gump and invested in Apple back <laughs> in the uh, early 90s. <laughs> and now you have automated income. But let's be honest, that's something which, one, you can't reverse engineer. And two... It's probably a very small percentage of listeners who have actually done that. And if you have done that, then you're probably sitting, listening to this on a beach somewhere. Um, Or not, or sat in your native country thinking, maybe I should live abroad, I don't know. Maybe you should um, refer back to 65. If if you're here now, though, you probably will listen to that. Maybe skip this one if you've got an automated income. um, Just tune in next week. Yeah, well, we talk about where. Um, Okay, so... Um, I know that sounds really simplistic, and the three options were job. I, <laughs> I, think, I think the actual only option was get a job. <laughs> no, not necessarily, because there's there's a nuance. <laughs> there's a nuance. There is a and it be be an employee, be a freelancer, or be a business owner. And I think those are the, those are the nuances of that. Yes. Um, now, what we're going to talk about is in each one of these, there's several different ways in which you can do things. So uh, for some of you, well, for, mo- for or almost everyone listening to this, there'll be one particular thing that tickles your pickle. And you'll be like, yep, that's the route for me. But I want to start off with a little bit of real talk. And Leanne's given me like the nod as if to say, yes, tell mm-hmm. them, guy, tell them how. Mm-hmm. If you want to move abroad and go and get a job in a different country, you're probably going to have a bad time. Oh, I, I didn't realize that was where you were going. Mm. Oh, continue. My thinking is that 
if you are if your if your idea is to go and just get on a plane get in your car drive get somewhere rent an airbnb and go right let's go job hunting on monday i think that is a very very bad idea oh that's an awful idea yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm back yeah no it's a really bad idea yeah so uh, and i think a lot of people i mean this sounds stupid it sounds like being flippant but a lot of people we see have done that they say right i'm i'm coming to croatia for example where we are coming to croatia in september any any ideas where i can get a job i'm an engineer and it's like well hang on a minute croatia's got plenty of engineers and why would they give and give and well there's also there's the (laughs) there's the why would an employer give someone who doesn't necessarily doesn't speak native or doesn't necessarily speak the native language a job over someone who does and also there's the like the legal part side of that because a lot of countries australia and new zealand won't allow you to go and work somewhere if the job can be done within it by someone who comes from that country it's true it's true then then yeah typically in terms of especially third country immigration so excluding people who are European Union citizens moving to another European Union state, you lucky devil. That probably doesn't apply to you as much, but otherwise it does. But I think the thing is, rather than kind of to explain maybe why it's a bad idea, and we touched on this in the last episode, moving abroad is one of the most stressful and most disruptive things you can do to your life. You're basically, imagine your life as a water balloon. You're throwing it at a wall and hoping it doesn't burst. (laughs) And all the preparation you do is like wrapping your little water balloon in some kind of protective coating. And the more preparation you do and the more things you figure out before you go, the more chances that balloon ain't going to pop. That's a really, really good way of putting it. Um, although slightly strange way of putting it, but I do like it. I think it. it's a good analogy. I like it. I do like it. We we don't have enough latex-based analogies, do we? <laughs> I think on this podcast. <laughs> we'll work on that. We do have episode 69 coming up soon, so oh. <laughs> might be an opportunity. You're such a child. <laughs> I, I am. So. But no, I think the point is, if you if you want to live and work abroad and you want to make it try and make it a sustainable move figuring out how you can afford to do that is a really important question if you have savings in the bank and you're just gonna go and see if you can make it work fine good for you my advice however would be to maybe look at it as like more of a an adventure a time traveling and enjoy it because i think my concern would be if people were like i've got 10 grand in the bank whatever x money in the bank I'm going to go there, I'm going to enjoy it for a couple of weeks, and I'm going to try and find a way to make money. I'd worry that you're actually going going to spend the majority of your savings just stressing yourself out about how you're going to make money. Whereas if you actually were like, right, I've got 10 grand, I'm going to have an amazing trip, and I'll see how it goes, and if I can figure out a way to keep it going, fine. If I can't, fine. I just worry that you'd be stuck in this stressful little place where you're not really enjoying the experience that you're paying for. That's a really, really good point. Um, there's lots of stressful things that happen when you move, live and work abroad. And um, and and the last thing you want to be doing is worrying that you're running out of money. Um, and, and to be fair, we've said before, the plus side of this is that living in European countries, unless it's the centre of Berlin or somewhere, or Lisbon or Madrid, then it is going to be probably a lot cheaper than living in the UK, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand particularly. Hello, my sister, if you're listening, and there's a running joke about the data costs over there. Oh, my God. They are. Vodafone New Zealand should should go and take a long, hard look at themselves in the Business mirror. Business is good at Vodafone <laughs> New Zealand. Yeah, bastards. But anyway, um, so you don't want to be worrying about that. You want to be worrying about where your next beer is going to come from. You're going to be worrying about, is it going to be sunny tomorrow? And, uh, and spoiler alert, it probably is. Exactly. And I think if you're in this situation, if you've got money in the bank, go back. Think about the why. Why do you want to spend this money? by going abroad is it to have an adventure is it to see the world is it try and change your life and whatever that answer is make a budget figure out where you're gonna go tune in next week make a budget figure out exactly how long that can take you put a period of time on that you're just gonna enjoy the experience of where you are and be fully open to the fact that you're probably not gonna make it work but you'll have a great time Absolutely. And so if you've got 10 grand in the bank, you've probably got yourself two years in Mostar or Albania or places like that. Yeah, um, Ukraine, perhaps, although maybe not Ukraine in the current political climate. It's a bit, it's a bit mm. spicy. <laughs> a little spicy. Um, 
But anyway, so let's get down to brass tacks. So we've said already there are three ways, which is number one, get a job. Number two, get a gig. Number three, start a business. Oh, I like that. Do you like that? Yeah. I should have started with that, shouldn't I? Maybe when you're editing this, just like insert that bit at the beginning before we went off on the massive tangent about people with disposable income and savings. We shall do that. Okay. So get a job, get a gig, start a business or continue a business. Um, there's lots of great stories of this guy. Uh, there's one particular guy I can think of um, who's had an old-fashioned sweet company. He lived in Lancashire and he realised that he could run the business entirely remotely from the hills of Andalusia and probably about on about a tenth of his ink a tenth of what his outgoings were back so are we then. starting with the business is that what we're going to explore no first? i was just trying to give an example i mean you'll see this is skewed because i have been a freelancer and i have a couple of businesses leanne has been an employee and a freelancer and also now now partner in a new business which we'll talk about in a dun, second. Dun, dun. <laughs> so you're going to see this is going to split firmly down the middle where i'll be talking about business and leanne and a little bit about freelancing leanne we're talking principally about being employee and a little bit about freelancing does that sound fair it sounds fair is that a deal it sounds wise and fair so we've got job gig business let's yes. talk about business because you've already already started to think about you start to thought there okay so if somebody has an existing business yep. that little story that you just told what what kind of thinking can that start for them? Okay. Now, if you have a business which you make sandwiches for builders in Luton and you go around and around, this is a challenge for you because how are you going to do that when you live in... Um, let's just shoot an arbitrary place. Let's just go. You're living in Paris. Um, that's not a great choice if you if you want to live somewhere cheap. But anyway, let's just say, <laughs> <laughs> let's change that. You're living in Malaga, one of our favourite places in the world. So Malaga is relatively expensive, but it's not as expensive as Paris. So you live in Malaga. You're obviously not going to fly back every lunchtime to go and do sandwiches, pedal sandwiches to builders. Well, not in these times. Not in these times. <laughs> that's actually another really good point. Actually, is that maybe two years ago, three years ago, you could have said, right, I'm going to fly back and um, have meetings with potential clients. If you're if you're a services based businesses business and your margins are good then it's actually probably cheaper to fly from Malaga to London than it is to get a train from say Edinburgh to London probably but let's stick with that first thought okay. so so the the option is can you is this what you're getting at is can your exist your existing business mm -hmm. can you run that remotely absolutely and so I would look I would take take a piece of paper and I'd write down all things that you have to do locally and actually, there's a lot of tech that's going to help you with that. So, for example, uh, Skype Numbers, which is a, I think it's about six quid a month, and you can get a number in the UK that rings your phone via VoIP, which is like a Wi-Fi call, via VoIP um, anywhere in the world. So you can still be based in Manchester with an 0161 number, but sitting in Bali answering the phone as if you're in Manchester. So there's that kind of thing. Uh, there's virtual post boxes, virtual mailboxes, which are about 20 quid a month or something. And then they will scan your email, scan your mail and send it over to you. Um, you've got all kinds of other little apps that, <clears throat> excuse me, there are apps that will help you to run your business. But of course, if you have a business where you have to be there, like for example, Excuse me, sorry about that. If you have a business where you have to be there, for example, like you provide care, you're a, you know, you you go in and you provide care for the elderly, then that's not a business that's going to work. Okay, so keeping it practical, then, if someone owns a business and they think of, as you say, if they if they it's an on the ground, very obvious business, then not an option. But if someone's thinking like, mm, could I? How much for? Could that? Could I do remotely? Would you say literally like make a list like what I can do remotely, what I can't? What I can't, what maybe technologies I can implement to address those or potentially what resource I could employ on the ground. Well, I think that's it, is that if you were to increase your prices by, say, 30%, could you afford to get someone else to do that? If you go back to episode, I can't remember off my head, I think it's 61, where we talked to Alex, um, who he lived in the UK he wanted to start a business in the Alps. So what he did was from his own income, his own salary, is that he set up a business in the Alps and he paid someone to do the physiotherapy in the Alps while he was sitting in, I can't remember exactly where I was, somewhere in Hertfordshire, Flint, Fleet, I can't remember where it was, Hampshire maybe. But he was sitting there and getting someone else to do that. And that was a proof of concept for him and he ended up moving out to the Alps. I think what's really interesting about that as well is I think that there is a potentially a danger 
for some business owners who have started to scale their business to still be a little bit too involved in the day to day mm. when really they should be now thinking about being you know, above the business, don't mean to sound like a right twat, but rather than working in the business, working <laughs> on the business. Whoever said that, just get in the bin. Michael Gerber. But it's a, it's a fair point. So you probably need to be thinking a bit more about strategy and growth and whatever else. And actually, are you spending your time on activities that aren't adding value to your business? And if you are, and they happen to be on the ground, and you can outsource them at a reasonable price that's affordable for your business, that's a good option, right? As a business owner who's done both, um, a lot of a lot of times you find that you do things that go, oh well, I have to be done by me because only I know how to change the toner in the photocopier, and really all it is is just you wanting to feel important. <laughs> and if you can get over that, then you can think: a, can someone else change the photo toner in the photocopier? B, do I even need a fucking photocopier? Can I not use the print on demand? Well, not in stuff? these times. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just use the, the print-on-demand service where you literally send a PDF, PDF off and it gets sent to your client the next that day? That was brilliant. I used that when I was living and they knew before you come for me, okay? I was working <laughs> on a contract basis for the NHS and employee engagement um, when we were living in Spain. But you know the NHS. To be fair, this was about five years ago, so it might be different now. We still had to send paper invoices. So I would do exactly that. Email invoice off, it would get sent in the post, it would all lovely hunky dory it's, it's amazing what actually services there are and especially now we've had two years of remote working there's gonna be loads more but i remember you saying once to me when um we were talking perhaps around business coaching or other things or something i can't remember the context but i remember you saying this to me but you were saying kind of like if you have a business but you are completely fundamental in the core product or service of that business being produced you don't have a business, you have a job. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want. But what? But I think, I'm worried that we're going to get in the weeds here. And this is such gold information here. Like Leanne's just given you, like, for example, stamp, S-T-A-N-N for Nigella, at P, um, stamp.com or uh, PC to paper or any of those kind of things. You can literally do a Word document, upload it, and it'll be put in the post for you and sent the next day. But so you've got all that tactical stuff. But really what we're talking about here is if you if you can run your business by from somewhere else and accept that the problems that are going to come up you can solve or worst case scenario you have to fly back, then you've got no excuse. You should be. You've got a good opportunity. Yeah. And But as well, I think this is an add-on to that. And I didn't mean to kind of get too in the weeds or go down tangent, but... In terms of looking at your business in that way, if you want to build a business and scale a business, you need to figure out how to train other people or outsource the creation of your products and services to other people. Otherwise, it's it's stuck because you've only got so many hours in your day wherever you are in the world. So actually, if you think you have a business like that, but you could potentially outsource it or train people up, then that's probably the first step in then facilitating your that that transition your business to them move abroad. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if, if you even if you do have something like, let's say you've got a nail salon where it is you and one other person doing the nails, that that's possible to do that abroad. Um, it's a very much more difficult, but it's possible to do that. So I don't want to put you off. Um, there was definitely an English uh, couple who did that in Spain and they mm -hmm. just targeted the expat market. Um, <clears throat> by, Absolutely. And there, there are opportunities to do that, but it's... It's a lot more complicated and it's a lot more higher. We think, go back to that water balloon. You're not putting a protective layer of your water balloon you're if you're not. just going to go abroad and try and start a business. So that's not really what we're talking about. If you just want to try, then of course. But, you know, we're talking about kind of more practical and lower risk ways of, of doing it. So finishing off the business side, as somebody mm -hmm. who has multiple businesses, one of which that is UK based and you run in partnership remotely mm -hmm. what are the downsides what are the challenges what are the things that bug you i think honestly there's probably the biggest one is the guilt that my business partner does the stuff that's on the ground mm -hmm. and i do the mm -hmm. stuff that is remote and i think and if he is listening then he might disagree to this but i feel that it's kind of fairly split but if something happens, like my business is property, so I, I have uh, my, my partner and I have a number of properties in the UK that we rent out. And 
if a you know if a house floods i'm not going to fly back and look at it if it needs someone to go and do it so he has to go and do that and there's agreements in place and mechanisms to make sure that you know his time is reckon is whatever the word is uh, but th i think that's one of the big ones um but in terms of other businesses that i run or whatever i think it's, it's going to meet it's going to it's going to it's going to flow nicely into the freelancer side, which is the next section, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes a business <coughs> is just being a freelancer. So, I mean, what's your... Oh, you're about to take a drink of gin, aren't you? But what's your, what's your thoughts between the difference between a running a business and being a freelancer? I think typically as a freelancer, you're, in, you're contracted by other businesses or individuals to do work for rather than generating your own sales and leads and marketing and whatever mm -hmm. well you still do generate your own leads because for example if you are a copywriter then you're probably trawling um people per hour and um, upwork and all that for for gigs aren't you yeah that's true that's true yeah but just to, so we can define a freelancer a freelancer what would you want to define it well, maybe there are different shades of freelancer. I don't know. Maybe it's a spectrum. But I think just let's just keep it real simple and assume that a freelancer is that you perform some work for a client that is paid on the result rather than you getting an hourly wage or you get an annual salary to do to, to turn up at between nine to five. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds good. So let's talk about freelancers for a bit. And and this is what's interesting is that Leanne transitioned from, and we're going to go to the final section in a second, which is one of the most exciting. I think if you do have a job at the moment and you are listening in 2022 when we've just had this two and a half or two and a bit year shitstorm of working from home, you are in, in for a treat because there's so many more opportunities for you now than there were for Leanne back in 2013 when she did this kind of thing. However, just... What are the what are the Americans and the business speaks? Let's just stick a pin in that for a moment. <laughs> we'll circle back round to it. <laughs> Such wankers. So um, let's just go back then. So as a freelancer, you are a freelancer, Leanne. Tell me. Yes. Tell me what's your if someone's thinking sitting there thinking I could freelance. What does it mean? What do you do? How do you find clients? Go. Freelance has changed since I, I started. I mean, the, I think the pandemic had a bit to do with that as well. But essentially, the first thing that I looked at when I, I started to think about freelancing work is what are my core skills, transferable skills? What can I do within the world of freelance opportunities? Um, to understand that, I started looking at freelance job boards, like people per hour, um, what the other one like pro blogger media bistro upwork upwork all stuff like that to really just get a sense of the types of jobs that people are posting um and then for me it became quite obvious because my background is you know, business psychologist at that time i was working very much in um, recruitment employability um coaching so for me it was quite and i've, I've written all my life, I have a, you know, a degree that that requires that. I won't, I won't go into the prizes I won at school, but you know, <laughs> she's a writer. When you say writing, just define that a little bit more. Um, so critically analyzing information, presenting arguments, um, you know, distilling information to something that's more digestible and sexy. Um, so for me, I was kind of like looking. Okay, well, so what are my kind of skills? Recruitment, employability, writing. Um, coaching and that kind of for me pointed me towards um, executive branding which is a fancy word for resume writing LinkedIn profiles and coaching at an executive level so I started doing that and then I don't think I can speak much to the freelance world beyond that because I got super duper lucky um, and actually the the second client that I found ended up being a client that I'm still working with now in various different ways. Um, so essentially that freelancing gig turned into a, what was essentially a remote job. And I think the interesting thing, and that's why I say kind of research the platforms, think about your skills, is it's amazing that actually the the number of, of different jobs and professions that are on there from like developing, I, I've used people prior to have um, 
policies developed for me as being being mm-hmm. self-employed and having a business um there's accountants on there there's recruiters on there there's salespeople on there there's there's it's it's almost like having like an online temp agency where you can kind of like dip in maybe just call on someone for a specific job maybe for a week worth of hours but then there are opportunities as well on there that are are longer term or people use it to try people out mm. so rather than kind of investing themselves in a fancy recruitment process that you know gives people you know trials and that kind of stuff it's actually a good way to just just try people out the only thing is because those platforms got very very competitive and i'm talking pre-pandemic so lord knows what they look like now the price the the hourly rates do get pushed right down bear in mind as well it's a global platform so you're competing with people with the same skills who live in various places in the world where income is typically lower and cost of living is much lower so they can afford to to cost lower so there is that competition side to it but I think as an initial point of research, it's worth looking at. Definitely. And if you are going to be a freelancer, then I would suggest you look at niching down. I would suggest that you become a, if you are a copywriter, for example, which is someone who writes stuff for websites and traditionally emails and uh, brochures and stuff, then just become a copywriter for, for e-commerce or shaving brands or something like that. Because um, that's got two advantages. First of all, is that you are going to be much more... Um, much more au fait with the the work in the, that you do. Um, but secondly, you're going to be able to charge a lot more because if someone, let's say that Gillette are looking for a freelance copywriter and there's two people, there's one person who works in the Philippines and I'm choosing the Philippines deliberately because there's something called onlinejobs.ph which is where you can get someone for like $2 an hour um, to do copywriting. So looking at someone like that, it's $2 an hour or someone else is charging $200 an hour but the $200 an hour has worked for King of Shaves, has worked for other shaving brands. It's all they do is shaving copywriting and they're $200 an hour, then they're more, much more likely to get to get you. Now, of course, that's, that, that's an entirely different conversation for a different day because that's a scary thing to do. However, that is, in my opinion, the way that you differentiate yourself and you get a premium price for what you do. Absolutely. And I think as well, if you're looking at anything around... I think particularly around writing, whether it be writing copy, whether it be writing resumes, whether it be writing policies, whether it, any kind of way you're producing a written document, you have to be really freaking good. Like, like not just like, oh, I'll phone this one in because if you do, you won't work with that client again. You have to be really good. And, and what amazes me is a number of times, Al, for your marketing business, you've looked for copywriters and you've set them like a paid, a paid trial to produce an um, mm-hmm. article for you. The people that have missed the deadline, mm-hmm. the people that haven't followed the brief, the people mm-hmm. that just haven't done it all. Mm-hmm. What? Like you, you have to remember that as a freelancer, you are the product. You are the business. Your reputation is everything. And it only takes one bad job to ruin the whole thing. Just Google freelancer on Amazon. You'll see there's loads of great books. But the, the key in, I think, is it right in saying the key is that number one is you do what you say you're going to do. Number two is that you deliver exactly what the person wants following instructions. Um, and three, you just try and specialize wherever you can. Um, and I think that's really, really key. And it is really interesting. I mean, I I got an email, a really weird email. Um, I don't think I told you about this. A really weird email about uh, two months ago just from this guy. And the the subject line was, you're an asshole. He was American. (laughs) How did he know? Well, I was going to say, that (laughs) that in itself wasn't a massive surprise to me. Um, But he said something like, I can't believe it. I did all this work for you back in so-and-so, so-and-so, and you never even replied. And this was one of the trialees that we did back, really? we did? yeah, back yeah. in Serbia, in Belgrade, um, and and I and I was like, right, okay, first of all, you're not wrong, <laughs> I am an arsehole. <laughs> but but secondly, um, you got paid for that, and here's a copy of the receipt of when I sent you the money. And thirdly, um, here's my feedback that I told you it wasn't good enough, and that was two years ago. So what what? Why I'm living rent free in some dude's mind in fucking Kansas, I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, but he's clearly really upset with me. Anyway, so let's move on now as we get into the into the the autumn of our podcast episode. So can I just Sorry, ask, where on. do we fit like the consulting thing? Do we fit that mm. in business, or do we fit that in freelance? I think 
that if you are just a single console, let's say you are, I mean, I only know the digital world, so I'm going to use this. Let's say that you are a Google Analytics consultant, then you can probably do 100, 200 grand a year uh, as being a freelancer um, easily because you, you should be charging 50 to 100 pounds or dollars an hour. Um, and you should, and I don't know if that maths works actually, but, but if you're doing sort of 40 hours a week, then you know you should be making a decent wage from that. And then you're a freelancer. But if you want to start a consultant C, then I think that's different. And that's something that we're doing right now. So I mean, if you're interested in that, then drop us an email and we'll tell you about our journey because we're starting from scratch a consultancy. Okay, so, so pre said consultancy, would you still consider me a freelancer who just happens to consult for organizations on an individual basis? Not a loaded question, it's fine to say yes. I think that both of us did a, did a similar thing and I think that we would say we're a consultant but we're actually a freelancer. Okay, then I think the freelancing thing needs a little bit more. Okay. So I think that's one way to find it is to look at your your skills and how you can apply it to typically like freelancer gig type jobs. The other is actually to pursue more of kind of an advisory consultancy project based role. And that's what I transitioned to from that initial freelance stuff. That's what you've done as well since we've been abroad in marketing. Um, and I think if you are in any kind of professional services job or I mean, name one, sales, marketing, operations processes risk audit compliance hr psychology can you name one that you can actually just do that on a consultancy basis for small companies procurement go back to our nail salon which yeah. it feels like you have to be sitting there doing someone's nails no you can be a consultant who has built a net who knows how to get new customers in who want the nails done you're a trainer you're yeah yeah, yeah virtual trainer there's loads of things you can do. And also, I think it's about thinking a bit outside the box. And so, for example, um, I don't know, you have an air expertise, but it's in one particular place. Thinking about how you can expand that. I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example. Say you work in marketing for a, I don't know, give me an industry. Huh? Air. Air travel. An air travel firm. <laughs> Aeroplanes. An airline. <laughs> airline. That's the word I was thinking of. <laughs> Okay, so, so let's assume you work in air. <laughs> <laughs> and what does what on. does this person do in air? Um, they are in charge of the online booking system for Ryanair. Okay, are we talking like customer service, or they manage the actual application technology? Let's say customer service. Let's say they run the call center. And how long have they been? Oh, they run the call. They're not just in customer service. They run the call center. How long have they been doing that? Oh, Derek's been doing it for years. Although he started off, you see, he started off as, as a steward and then he worked his way up. And uh, then he went ground-based. Um, and then, you know, it's, you know what happened with his mom, don't you? So, I mean, that's a whole different story. So he ended up being ground-based. And, of course, he had to stay in Luton. But the contact centre was in Luton. So he ended up going, well, let's just, let's just work here. And so he worked his way up from uh, literally answering the phones to now he runs a team of 15 people who deal with the refunds for Ryanair flights that don't fly. Refunds. So we're talking complaints. I'm, you know I'm making this up, don't you? I know, but I continue to. So refund. So people are complaining to get yeah. a refund, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so it was, sorry, was Tough it Derek? Conversations. Derek. Derek. Oh yeah, yes, yeah, Derek. Yeah. So Derek is now living in, let's say, Bali, because most people do. I'll talk about that next week. So <laughs> Derek is living in <laughs> Bali. He's coming to the end of his savings, and he's thinking about how he could possibly make money as a consultant. Let's talk about all the various skills that Derek has. Mm -hmm. so one he's talking about a customer service mm -hmm. there's gonna be plenty of organizations out there that are gonna need training it's because smaller organizations who mm -hmm. don't have that because he's worked in air you're mm -hmm. talking like massive multi-million dollar businesses mm -hmm. he can bring breast best practice in customer service and complaints management to the small businesses of the world that really need that. Absolutely. He's also got ground level experience in terms of customer service. So he could consult for a a, serv a, a business, a cafe even, mm -hmm. who were trying to to understand, well, how do I how do I make sure my people are happy while still maintaining these health and safety guidelines that Derek just happens to know all about because he's been a flight attendant. Mm-hmm. 
There are so many different ways also, you can... Sorry, to interrupt. On. Also, Derek can talk about how to reduce the number of refunds because that's what his team did day in, day out, was try and reduce people who wanted money back, try and turn that into a new customer. I also imagine that Derek is going to have a fair amount about, like, like tele, 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 telephony. Telephony. <laughs> telephony. It was there. I couldn't get it out. <laughs> telephony um, technology and that type mm-hmm. of thing, and what's affordable. He's also a team leader. He's run a team of 15 people. Oh, so he's going to know all sorts. And that's in a high turnover environment, of course. And just going to know all sorts as well about leadership and engagement and how to support people. Ergonomics, I'm sure he's going to know a bit about as well. Going back to health and safety, how you make sure people who are sat down all day in one position still, you know, get to move around and look after themselves. So I think what we're saying And then is, there's a whole scheduling thing. You've got probably, I'm imagining it was a 24-hour call center and complaints at Ryanair. Of course. Scheduling alone is a skill. An go. absolute skill. Derek could be a consultant 12 times over. Well, good go. for you, Derek. Yeah. And this is something where he, he literally could say, right, okay, well, I'll do a project that's going to cost you two grand and it'll be a week. And what I'll do is, you're not paying for my time. That's the biggest transition, I think, from going from an employee to a, to a or even a freelancer to a consultant, I think. And, they, and I think that is the difference. In fact, you know what? I've just decided that's the difference. Is a freelancer works on an hourly rate and a consultant works on a results-based rate. Or a project, yeah. Or a project, project rate, perhaps, yeah. And, it, and the thing as well, just to go back to Derek, I think if you're thinking about this in your skills, is is... You know, thinking about, you know, Derek's worked for Ryanair, one of the world's largest airlines. He has amazing results in terms of reducing the number of refunds. And he did it while retaining his staff. So if you go to a small business as a consultant and they say, why should I hire you? Be like, well, here are three reasons to start. And I think that's the thing as well. You need to, I guess it's more thinking about your experience in a professional world. I think it's what I struggled with initially. And that actually translating that into a, a consultancy role, it'd be smaller, medium business or larger businesses, those names can carry weight and that experience can carry weight. And I think it's learning to, yeah, just sell yourself. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, and, and, and certainly us Brits are like, we, we bristle a little at the idea of selling ourselves. But think of it this way. And this, this is, I think, the, I think this might be a good way to think about it. A freelancer pushes their services. I am a copywriter. Do you want copy written? Mm-hmm. A consultant says, I increase your sales. I have to do that by writing good copy. But that's the key difference. Is a copywriter's pushing their services. A consultant is allow, is allowing people, is pulling people towards them by saying, I will increase your sales. He's going that one level above. So from Derek's point of view, yes, he could go and work via the internet as in a call center, the virtual call center. He sits at home and takes calls. Um, and that is him pushing his services. Going, I take calls. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, you're on five, ten, fifteen dollars an hour. I don't know what you're on for that. But for some, but to go to a business, and go. I will show you how Ryanair sets up their refund system and reduces refunds, and we only refund one in ten people because we're so good and we turn them around. That's going to be a ten grand project. Thank you very much. Over the next three weeks, fine. Because think about the value you're producing as a consultant compared to the actual cost you are. Like, oh, there it is. There's the difference. Mm, a value versus profit, profit, profit and cost center. Is that what it is? That's what it is. <laughs> a freelancer is a cost. A consultant is an investment. Nice. If if I could, do you know what? If you can just give me a few minutes to unplug this mic and take it off the stand, I will drop it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I laughed right into my <laughs> So we're coming. We're coming to the end of our podcast, or a bit. A, a, we're coming to the end of our episode. Let's talk about probably. I think might be the simplest, not the easiest, but the yeah. simplest transition. And this is what Leanne has got direct experience in. So. I would love you to tell us a story of how you went from a 400 square feet square foot flat in Manchester where it rains 390 days a year to living in Malaga in the sun. More days than there are in a year. Well, it rains twice some days. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> to a flat in Malaga which cost half as much and was three times as big. Yeah, I think we've told this story before and actually we do have two episodes, back episodes on how to make money while living and working abroad. So go listen to them as well. We talk about similar things but in a slightly different way and there's more examples. Um, but yes, essentially I I had a very progressive manager and when I told him that we were moving, he asked me how much my role could I do remotely. I said 8%. He said fine. 
go, come back a week a month, we're cool. So I think what I learned from that is one, wow, because this is, this is 2013. This is like all pre-pre-pandemic. Um, but I think what, what I learned was actually if you, and I, you know, if you've been through the last two years, you've been working remotely, probably more than likely if you're in the role that enables you to do so. Um, and we're talking to you. There's loads that you can, most roles can be done abroad. So the only thing you're, you're having to consider is whether your employee is willing. That's going to depend on things like how often do you need to be in the office? You're in a hybrid situation or do you actually fully remote? You need to be there for certain meetings and whatever. Um, what's the cost of you living abroad? Can you take your equipment over there? What's the risk? Blah, blah, blah. Um, what else? Tax situations. Will you still remain a, a UK taxpayer or a taxpayer in your native country? There are different things to to understand and, and talk through, but I think there's never been a better opportunity for people who are in roles to have that open conversations with their their managers about how they can do that remotely full time and not only remotely but overseas absolutely so there's two parts to this there's now that until 2022 there are probably far more remote based positions available i know you've got some thoughts on that in a second or there is your position which traditionally was done in an office and now you're doing remotely which if you're doing it, if your office is in London and you're sitting in Stevenage, then why not sit in Bali? Well, actually, don't sit in Bali because Bali is not one of my favorite places. But why not go to Thailand and do it there? Um, so, you know, there's there's that massive opportunity for you right now. If you're listening in 2022, in fact, hopefully, if you're listening in 2024, 25, it's all changed and people don't have to be in the office anymore. <laughs> and you'll be thinking, man, this has aged, this podcast. <laughs> so... You have these opportunities. A quick aside, if you are looking for a way to do a staged exit, then there's a great few chapters in the book, um, Four Hour Work Week by... Bro, Mad 1.0, I think. Oh, what was his name? <laughs> Seth. Go, no, oh, it's, it's gone. Else. Just Google for our work week. It's got it's got a palm tree on the. Uh, on the I'm going to interrupt you in a minute when it comes back to me, the name. Um, so there's a step by step way to to retract from your current position. Um, however, I do want to talk. To you. Do you feel that you've explained how you transitioned from Manchester to Malaga? Well, enough. Do you think? It's not a loaded question. I'm just making sure what? that you covered it off. Well, okay. So I, in terms of process, mm -hmm. I literally sat down, wrote a list of all the things I could do remotely, the things that I do on the ground, but actually I shouldn't be doing because I'm managing a contract and someone else should be doing that. The stuff that I absolutely have to be on the ground for. And then within that, things that a, a person of management level needs to be on the ground for does it specifically need to be me um and then when i worked that out it was really a case of sitting down the manager and saying well this these are things i think i can do remotely do you agree yeah no these are the things i think i can delegate to someone else yes no these are the things that i am going to have to be back on the ground for those things did equate to about four to five working days a month um so then we look at costs and as i said before it was I think my manager actually laughed when he asked me how much it was to fly from Malaga to Manchester because uh, it was about what roughly usually to exclude like July, August, maybe the odd half term, less than £50 turn. Mm -hmm. um, and he was like, I came up from London today and my train ticket was 250 quid. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, you're sending me to train course in London on Friday and that's going to cost you 200 quid. So then I think it's just looking at costs and logistics of that. Um... Oh, and and the logistics of that, you know, if you do need to come back for certain periods of time, or well, what are the arrangements with that? Is that covered by the company? Is that covered by you? If you, is there a budget to it? Things you need to factor in, and then you know, it, that in itself is going to factor where you can go and having access back to the UK should you need it. Um, but ultimately, that's how I transitioned. And yes, there was a few people that were like, "What the fuck? <laughs> My hands in Spain." <laughs> Um, but that was driven from jealousy and I still smashed my job and got a promotion 12 months in. So whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing is, it's, it, yes, it's difficult, but everyone has it more experience now about working remotely. I think you just need to have those conversations up front, try and figure out all the details. 
um, and enjoy because I think that was probably my, my yeah, it was probably my favourite times actually of living and working abroad. That was good. It was good. It was cool. I felt important. <laughs> I think you were on a plane with Andy Peters from the Broom Cup and Rick Stein. And Rick Stein. If you're not from the UK, you, those you won't know who those people are. Um, so I think the the final point I think would we, we, be important for Leanne to expand on. Um, apart from the fact that just let's just take a moment. What you've just listened to there is someone who worked for a a, a contractor for a governmental agency mm-hmm. who yeah. negotiated to work to live in Malaga and come back four or five days a month and do her job in Manchester. So, I mean, if you work. Yeah, I guess some of the things in that, what those conditions were, one, my expenses were actually equal to or less than other managers in the company, two, my performance remained the same, and three, the team were okay with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were conditions, and I think we, we initially said, well, well, we'll trial it for three months, and I think one of those, you know, one of those conversations is like, we'll try it for three months, and if not, we'll accept your notice. So, okay, you know, but that's fine. You give it a go, don't you? I think that's a really important point is that Leanne handed a notice in first. Am I, I've got that right, haven't I? Yes. Yeah. And then there was then the conversation started. Um, so she was obviously a very valuable employee and that's why that's why it worked and she made it work. So, you know, if, if you if you pack bags in Asda on a Saturday, it's you're not guaranteed that they'll let you do that from Thailand. But anyway, I think that's more about having to be on the ground than it is about a reflection of somebody's <laughs> capability or indeed the flexibility of Alistair as a company. Fair enough. So as a little <laughs> summary, um, pe- people who are offering um, remote w- jobs at the moment online, there's quite a few of those saying you're a remote position. It's fine. You can you can be remote. However, you've noticed a couple of little weird things about those, haven't you? Yeah. So I think that's the, the other thing, isn't it? In terms of job, and we'll run through these quickly. One, that you if you work for a company already that has overseas offices, easy, cool, look at that. Um, or two, you actually apply for a job in another country. If that's the case, go back and listen to Expat Empire. Uh, this is David from Expat Empire, and you carry on talking, and I'll find the um, episode. So he's a, he's a few episodes ago. He talks a lot about that. That's why he started his expat journey. Um, and the final way in terms of getting a job is actually getting a remote job. And there are so many more now than they used to be. You're really limited in the past of of jobs that were remote, although there are obviously um, remote companies out there, more so now. One thing that I have noticed um, is that LinkedIn does now have a filter for remote jobs. I think LinkedIn is a really, really good jobs platform, so that's worth looking at. Um, but then I have noticed as well in some of the interview, in, interviews, some of the adverts that they specify you have to be based in a particular country and typically the country that, that organization is based in. Um, I question that from a legal perspective um, because I'm not sure if the job is remote, they can legally ask for someone to be in the country unless potentially it's around tax, in which case you may still choose to pay tax in in that the where that country is um so yeah to be aware of but i'm not sure i imagine that's gonna be we'll see that disappearing from adverts over the next few months as companies realize that legally they're not allowed to do that cool and i think that um so i think that let's just let's just summarize sorry i was slightly distracted because i'm you didn't listen to a word i said what did i say sorry what did you say exactly (laughs) I would. <laughs> I am trying. I'm just trying to quickly jot down the episodes that's, that are relevant to what we're talking about here. Uh, Indeed, we've got a few. Um, so um, we'll go through those in a second. But let's just summarise very quickly because we're probably what about fifty minutes in. Let's just summarise very quickly. There are a several op- several ways in which you can live and work abroad. Number one is that you can have a business that you can run remotely. And jump in, Leah, if I'm, if I'm getting this right. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> Number two is that you can be a freelancer and they basically you're working on an hourly rate for clients. No, sorry, that was number one. Number, t- <laughs> Start that again. Number one, you can run a business abroad, your own business abroad. Number two, you can be a freelancer where you work hourly for another client. Number three, you can be a consultant where you are basically value-based or results-based. Or project-based. 
um, that is what I would recommend for you if you're considering this. Um, number four is that you can take your existing job abroad and do that remotely. And number five is that you can find a job that allows you to work remotely. I'm not going to include number six, um, which was going living abroad and finding a job when you're there because that is such a tough, tough situation. If you get that, if but you, get you that could work, find a job abroad before you move. A lot of people do that with Australia, especially if there's skills gaps, don't they? True. And particularly if you're an organisation that has other offices, that's a good option. Or True. get a job at a company that does have other offices and then do it. Well, there you go. It's a longer term plan, but it would work. Very smart. So basically, we're talking about uh, freelancer. We're talking about business owner. We're talking about getting a job in some in some particular way. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, anything else to add to that before I go through the episodes that might be useful? No. <laughs> you can tell that Leanne's patience is low because her patience is about the same level as her gin, which is empty. So she's had enough of my shit. I told today. a lot, and I think people are bored. Well, we'll find out on the on the stats with the drop off is when you start talking. Um, five five episodes here that I think might be useful. Uh, number thirty five is talking to Will uh, Will Brutton, the coolest man in the world, um, who is a freelancer. So you can listen to hear, hear his story. Uh, he also started a business as well, which is interesting. Uh, number 36 is Dave that we talked about, uh, who's from expatempires.com. I was on his podcast last, oh no, next week I think I'm going to be on his podcast. And he went and got a job in with a company in Berlin. He's from America. So he's done that route. Uh, then you can talk to Melissa. Oh, you listen. Sorry, you can't talk to her because it's a one-way medium. You can listen to an episode 32, Melissa, 3232 Melissa, who basically is a freelancer. And she uh, works for American companies, but lives in Croatia. Number 28 is, I can't read my own writing. I, it says Colin Safili. Not sure what that is. <laughs> and number 21, which is our friend Paul, who went to work specifically, started working for a bank, and then the bank had an opportunity in Gibraltar, and he moved to Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is actually, if you look back, any episode we've had a guest we will have covered how they work so natalie and daniel are way with life expat pat who teaches in korea uh but tommy and Catherine who own a tiki bar on gilly Chorangan. um there's lots of people that we speak to talk about um how they moved in and and how they work abroad so just have a little look there's there's 65 episodes to choose from ignore podmas there's not much of quality in that <laughs> Okay, guys, so we have answered the question of how today, I hope. If we haven't, go to Instagram, search for Sideways Live, send us a DM. Or if you're not on Instagram, then uh, go to your email account and type in asksidewayslife at gmail.com. Send us an email and tell us what we did wrong because we will happily correct it. And if you've got an experience or you want to be in a podcast, let us know. We'd love to have you. Or indeed, if you have a question, if mm. you have a business or you're in a particular job at the moment and you're trying to figure out how to maybe do that as a freelancer or as a consultant, ask away. I mean, I'm not sure we'll know, but we'll pretend that we do. I bet we know someone who does know. That's probably, yeah, probably a better thing, actually, who knows mm. someone who does. Okay, so we've now answered question two of three. Question one was why question why live abroad question two was how do you live and work abroad question three is where that's the fun one and that's coming up next still week. trying to answer that question ourselves <laughs> <laughs> there's something we, we're going to call about called the empty car park syndrome where you drive into a car park there's one other car in this massive car park i bet you don't park in the first space that you draw into if you're anything like us because you just get overwhelmed and you just don't know where to park so that analogy has been stretched and killed and had the shit kicked out of it but we will deal with that next week when we talk <laughs> about where in the world you should live is that everything for today i think so right thank you for sticking with us for probably our longest episode ever i had to edit that down a bit oh, i don't know i think there's some good stuff in there you just can't be bothered can you <laughs> it's absolutely right <laughs> <laughs> bye guys bye, bye.